like to uh, start moving to your tables and seats. We'll get started in just a moment. There's nothing more satisfying than seeing how many people return the second day for the session. So it really is encouraging to, to see all of you here. Uh, my name is Tom Brock, uh, and I'm from MDRC, uh, one of the uh, partner organizations involved in this National Center for Post-Secondary Research. Uh, so I thought I would begin us off this morning just with a little bit of a recap of, of yesterday's conversations, uh, and then we'll quickly move into our first panel. I want to say, you know, as I listened uh, yesterday to the various presentations and also interacted with many of you in this room uh, during the breakout sessions and, and uh, during the, the less formal breaks, um, I really was struck by the progress uh, that we've made on a lot of these issues around developmental education uh, over the past several years, uh, certainly compared to where we were two years ago uh, at our conference for some of you who, who were there, um, and even more so in comparison to where we were six years ago when this center first started. Now, it certainly is not the case that we've solved all the problems around developmental education. Uh, it's still the case that far too many students are being placed into developmental education courses, uh, and more importantly, far too few of those students are actually completing, moving into college level courses and ultimately to college certificates or degrees. But that said, uh, we're seeing a lot of progress, I think, on, on many fronts, which is really due uh, to the good work of all of the people in this room. Um, and I think what's most encouraging to me is that we're beginning to see some uh, consensus emerging, some broad areas of, of agreement. Um, and I thought I would start out just by highlighting some of those, uh, those points. I think the first uh, big area of agreement that uh, I'm beginning to, to hear and see from many of you is uh, that we really need to rethink the front-end assessment process that goes on uh, that results in the placement of students into developmental education. Uh, I will leave for another conference uh, the issue about the actual validity uh, of the testing instruments that are used, uh, the compass and the AccuPlacer and, and all the like. Uh, there may be some different opinions just on, on that issue. But I think where we do agree um, is that simply relying on one short, simple, standardized test, a 20 or 30 minute test, uh, devoid of any other information about students, uh, devoid of information about their academic history, uh, their career goals, uh, their particular learning styles, is wholly inadequate. And uh, we need to do better, uh, I think, as, as a uh, broad community uh, working in community colleges to think about ways to conduct assessment in a more thorough uh, way that takes into account uh, much more about where students have been and where it is they're wanting to go. The second broad area of consensus uh, that I heard from the conference yesterday is really the importance of accelerating the progress of students through developmental education. This long sequence of courses uh, that's been established uh, in community colleges around the country, sometimes with three or more levels of developmental work before students get to college level work, uh, is simply leading to a situation where, uh, as Shana Jagger said, students are being over remediated and we're seeing far too many of those students drop out before they ever get to the first college level course. I think what was most encouraging to me yesterday uh, is uh, in all the breakout sessions, uh, all the innovation that's going on in the acceleration area. Uh, this really is an, an area where we're seeing all kinds of new ideas uh, uh, come into to blossom. Uh, there's the mainstreaming approaches that we've heard about from, for instance, the Community College of Baltimore County uh, and also Chabot College in California, uh, where students uh, just below college level are actually being placed into college level courses. There are the statistics-based models, um, drawing upon the work of the, the Carnegie Foundation and Yuri Treisman and others, uh, that really is a whole new model of thinking about how to provide math education that will get students to college level within the course of a year. There are the compression approaches that we've heard about from Broward County Community College and also from the Colorado State System, where uh, two or more courses are actually being consolidated uh, into a semester or other ways of packing much more information in and the standard slow progress uh, that we've seen in traditional developmental education. 
then finally, there are the modulari modularization approaches, um, which are really making very good use of technology to find out more precisely exactly where are the skill deficits that students have, and how can we place students into shorter modules, uh, perhaps just several weeks in some cases, to teach them exactly what they need to know, rather than put them through an entire course sequence covering a lot of information that perhaps they've already mastered. Now, these are all very different strategies, um, uh, but I think what they have in common uh, is that they all tend to put uh, our traditional notion of developmental education on its head, um, in that they uh, are not viewing developmental education students as uh, incapable of learning or somehow slow learners, uh, but really students who can be challenged to do much more in a much shorter period of time. The third area of consensus that I heard uh, yesterday um, is that we really need to shift away from uh, what I might call an intervention mindset uh, to thinking more holistically about the kinds of support students need while in, in community college. And I want to say, you know, definitively, it's not that interventions uh, don't work. In fact, we heard examples yesterday of uh, a number of interventions that do, uh, from summer bridge programs to learning communities. Um, and while not covered yesterday, there are many other examples around student support services and, and the like. But, um, you know, as CCRC and MPRC and other researchers have begun to look at more of the, the growing body of evidence from these kinds of short-term, you know, semester-based interventions, I think a general conclusion we can make across the board is that short-term interventions tend to lead to short-term results. They also tend to lead to relatively modest results. So, rather than thinking about, uh, you know, what we can do for students, uh, say, within one summer session or, or over a particular uh, semester, we need to be thinking much more about the whole college sequence. What do we need to do to provide better support and structure for students from the time they first encounter the college in orientation and assessment to what happens during their first semester, what happens as they continue into their second year, and all the way up into the point that they complete a certificate or degree. So I would be remiss uh, as a researcher if I uh, also did not uh, prioritize some next steps for our learning agenda uh, in this work. I came up uh, just myself with many ideas yesterday, and I'm sure many of you had good thoughts as well that uh, I would love to hear. Um, but I, I will prioritize perhaps just, just three that I think uh, we might focus on in our conversations later today. The first is the need, uh, I think, to develop uh, a bigger body of evidence around these various acceleration strategies that I mentioned just a moment ago. All that the evidence, uh, all the evidence that's been coming out on these strategies is very promising so far, but I, I think we need to acknowledge that that evidence base is still pretty limited. Um, and I think there are at least a couple of things that we need to be very well attuned to. Uh, one is the possibility still of unintended consequences around acceleration. Um, for all uh, the added support and all the added help they seem to be offering some students, there is still the possibility that they could be leaving some students behind who are not prepared or able to move that quickly. I think also uh, there's a very important set of questions around what types of acceleration strategies work best in particular contexts and with particular kinds of students. Um, I'm actually very excited that there's so many different ways of thinking about acceleration and I'm not viewing this at all as a horse race, but rather, you know, as different options that might be better suited uh, in some circumstances or to certain population groups, um, depending on, on, you know, again, the backgrounds, the particular situations uh, of those people and, and colleges. A second area where I think uh, we need to do much more research, and, and I'm actually very encouraged to see some of the work that's coming out from uh, Clive Belfield and, and others at CCRC, uh, is around the cost and cost effectiveness of these various reform strategies. Um, I think especially if we want to win over policymakers, that things like acceleration or uh, reformed ways of doing uh, the front end assessment are worth doing, we need much more evidence uh, to, to say that it's also uh, a cost beneficial way of doing business. I think this is most important if we think about uh, introducing some front end assessment processes that are more comprehensive than what take place currently. Uh, one main reason, of course, that colleges use uh, a standardized 20 or 30 minute test is that it's the cheapest thing in the world to do. You don't have to talk to any students, you don't have to process them uh, in any in-depth way. So if we begin introducing more of a counseling component at the front end, or if we begin taking into account their high school records or other kinds of data, we're going to need to think about how to pay for that. 
and perhaps, uh, you know, this is really a hypothesis, not anything that's known, uh, but if, if those kinds of more comprehensive assessment strategies lead to better placement of students uh, such that they take fewer developmental courses and shorten their time to degree, it seems to me we might have a very strong argument that that is worth the additional investment. The third area I think where some more research is needed is really building evidence uh, for those strategies that do work and those strategies that are cost effective on how to bring them to scale. And I really have to uh, uh, be uh, humble here as a researcher, uh, as much as I might value uh, the uh, definitive research report, one that shows without a doubt that a particular intervention makes a difference uh, and is worth doing. Uh, I know that research alone is not going to, to move the needle to make the difference as far as getting policymakers and oftentimes uh, many practitioners to act. So I think another area of conversation for all of those in the room today is how do we build the vision for reform? How do we create will among the various actors that need to be engaged in this effort? And how do we find or reallocate the resources in order to do things differently in developmental education? So our next panel uh, and our breakout sessions later this morning are going to be addressing uh, many of these topics. We're going to begin with a presentation by Mike Weiss of MDRC, who's going to talk about the Accelerated Study in Associates Programs, or ASAP, as it's known at the City University of New York. Uh, this is a very comprehensive program. It's probably uh, one of the first holistic models, uh, like I referred to a moment ago, uh, for which we have some preliminary evidence on effectiveness. Secondly, uh, Janet Quinn from MDRC is going to present some findings from the Developmental Education Initiative uh, this is an effort that was sponsored by the Gates and Lumina Foundations to try to help a group of community colleges that have been participating in the Achieving a Dream, the Dream initiative to bring uh, effective interventions to scale. And she'll talk to us about some of the lessons, good and bad, from that effort. And then finally, Nikki Edgecombe and Susan Wood from Virginia are going to be telling us about a statewide effort at developmental education reform in that state, uh, something that really took on the challenge of scale right from the very beginning. So I look very, very much forward to these conversations, and I want to thank you again for sticking with us in this conference and for your participation throughout. Thank you. Acknowledging my colleagues in this work, uh, Sue Scribner, who's in the back there, and Colleen Somo, as well as ASAP's director, uh, Donald Letterman, who's also uh, in the back there, and both of them will be available uh, in the breakout session that happens after this, so if you might want to come talk to them if I don't give you enough information. I also want to acknowledge the funders of this evaluation, the Helmsley Foundation and the Robin Hood Foundation, as well as the funders of the program, the Center for Economic Opportunity, Helmsley and Robin Hood as well. So I just want to start off by reminding everyone of the problem that I think we're all trying to resolve. And I'm going to start with a little graphical representation of this problem. So what you see on the screen right now are 100 credential-seeking students at two-year colleges. And as two-year colleges currently operate, this is how things work. 49 of these degree-seeking students will not earn a credential or transfer to a four-year school after six years from when they started college. Some of them will have dropped out. Some of them will be still plotting through community college. Twelve of them will have transferred to a four-year school. The remaining 39 are the ones who will have earned a degree or credential from this two-year institution. So this is how things are right now, six years after degree-seeking students begin their school. Now I want you all, if you don't mind, to imagine that you are one of these degree-seeking students back in college, and imagine that you're low income, that you're new to college, and that you just took a placement exam and found that you failed one or two of these, uh, you failed one or two of these uh, placement exams, and you need to take developmental education classes. So you're all in that mindset now. For many of you, a major concern is going to be financial. What will you do when your tuition bill arrives? How will you get to class? Can you afford to pay for that pricey intro to psychology textbook? These are concerns for many of you. But what if things were different? 
What if many of those financial obstacles disappear? CUNY's ASAP offers three forms of financial supports in order to lower those financial barriers. And it offers these supports for three full years. ASAP provides a tuition waiver, which covers the difference between your financial aid and the tuition and fees that you have to pay. It offers a free monthly Metro card, which reduces your financial burden and gives you no excuse for not showing up to class. ASAP provides you with free textbooks so that you have the essential materials needed in order to be able to do well in class. Still, still for many of you, the struggle is not just financial, but rather it's navigating life in this new and unfamiliar environment. As I'm sure many of you know, community colleges serve a disproportionate percentage of first and, college, first and family college goers who might wonder things like, how do I register for class? What classes should I take? Where is the library? What other services does the college offer that might help me out? How do I fill out that complicated financial aid form? But here's what many community colleges offer. You see, you've all been shrunk to little miniature blue people now. It's hard to tell that you're people at all, actually. One estimate suggests that many community colleges have one advisor for every 1,000 students. How much guidance can you really expect? But what if things were different? ASAP offers one advisor for every 80 students, and it requires that students meet with this advisor two times per month. And to help ensure that this happens, receipt of that monthly Metro card that I described in the previous slide is tied to meeting with the advisor. ASAP also offers other student support services, like enhanced tutoring in case you're struggling with your coursework, and enhanced career counseling in case you're trying to figure out what you want to do when you graduate, or in case you need a job while you're in school in order to pay your bills. And all of these services are offered for three full years. But there is no free lunch. To be a part of ASAP, you're required to enroll full time. To be a part of ASAP, you're expected to take your developmental education courses early. To be a part of ASAP, you're expected to meet with your advisor two times per month. So ASAP is a combination of both supports and requirements. So here's a list including a few additional key components that I haven't yet discussed, we only have 12 minutes after all, uh, of all the services that ASAP offers. We discussed the financial supports, and then there's also the student services. ASAP also has some course enrollment requirements. During your first semester, you have to be part of an ASAP seminar that covers topics like goal setting and study skills and academic planning. Courses are offered in blocked schedules during that first semester where groups of students are organized into t in by major to take two or more courses together, including that ASAP seminar and usually one of those developmental education courses. In addition to this, though, there's the requirements and certain messages that you get. Like I said earlier, you must enroll full-time to be part of ASAP, and you're strongly encouraged to take your developmental education class early. In addition, you're encouraged to enroll during the intersessions, so these sessions that are, you know, the fall and the spring, and then there's winter and summer, you're encouraged to enroll in the winter and the summer, so you continue to make progress throughout the year. And then finally, you're consistently given the message that you can and will graduate within three years of starting. So this is all great, um, but what does this translate into with respect to results? MDRC randomly assigned 900 students, just like you, at three CUNY community colleges the Borough of Manhattan Community College, Kingsborough Community College, and LaGuardia Community College. To either, and so they're randomly assigned either to experience ASAP or to receive the college's usual services. Their very early results are in, and they're pretty noteworthy. This is not one of the more noteworthy ones. But. <laughs> so what you see on the screen now are first semester enrollment rates, and this is just any type of enrollment. And the set of bars, you have the blue bar, which represents students that were randomly assigned to the program group and had the opportunity to participate in ASAP. And the red is the control group, those that signed up for the usual services in the college. And you can see 96% of people enrolled. That random assignment happened right before the beginning of the semester, so not surprising if you were in the program group. But there still was a two percentage point impact on just enrolling by finding out you're part of this pretty comprehensive program. So that's nice. But also recall that, as I said, ASAP requires full-time enrollment, and it provides many of the supports that are intended to make this more attainable. And also you should note that in order to participate in the study, all students, both 
those that were randomly assigned to ASAP and those that are in the control group said that they were willing to enroll full time. But what actually happens? Every single student pretty much that was in ASAP and enrolled enrolled full time, 96%. In contrast, only 85% of control group members enrolled full time during that first semester of study. So ASAP resulted in 11 percentage point impact on full time enrollment. Part time enrollment, as I'm sure many of you are aware, is considered a risk factor in higher education because it's negatively associated with your likelihood of graduating and other key long-term outcomes. So this program is demonstrating, so far at least, that there are quite a few part-time students that have given the right set of services and incentives would be willing to enroll full-time and actually do it. This is all nice as well, but still, enrollment doesn't uh, actually get you to graduate. You have to earn credits. So how did the program affect credit accumulation? At least in the early term, in the first semester, we can see that students offered the opportunity to participate in ASAP, earned 11.4 credits on average, <clears throat> compared to their control group that earned an average of 9.3 credits for an impact of 2.1 credits. Now is where you're all supposed to be very excited. Uh, if we, we can also break this impact up into the type of credits that students earn, those that are college level and those that are developmental, and you can see that the impact is spread between the two. So the encouragement to take these developmental education courses early seems to have worked and they took more courses and they earned more credits. And they also earned more college level credits. Also noteworthy, and not on the slide, uh, is that there was a 15 percentage point impact on the percentage of those students that completed the, the developmental education course sequence within that first semester of study. And this first semester includes the main session as well as the inner session, so meaning the winter or the summer. And for those of you that want to know, that's off a base of 32 percentage, uh, off of 32 continues, and unfortunately this is all the follow-up that we have. Uh, if we look at the second semester of study, we can see that 90% 90, 90 of ASAP students returned to class, compared to only 80% of controls for a 10 percentage point impact. And if we look at full-time enrollment, we can see that there's a 21 percentage point impact. So this is, this is pretty impressive. So if you want to put these results in context, comparing them to at least some other MDRC experimental evaluations, and I only am choosing MDRC experimental evaluations because that's what I have easy access to. Uh, if everyone in the audience wants to send me their experimental results from other studies, I'll line them all up. Um, but this graphic basically tells you in the first semester what was the impact on credits earned comparing ASAP to the other studies that MDRC has done. Now, I should note that those were studies of completely different interventions in a different context, targeting different populations. But it's still pretty notable that ASAP so far has had the largest impacts we've seen, at least in the short term, by trying out this more comprehensive approach. Uh, this is probably what we'd expect, but uh, it's, it's good news. If it, if it had been different, we'd be a little concerned, I think. So unfortunately, I don't really have any strong conclusions yet, because we're still very early on in this study. But I'll give you a hint at some of the things that we plan to look, to, look at in the upcoming years. Uh, so first is, much of what I discussed today about ASAP as a program was about ASAP as it is designed. So this is sort of like what the college told us. But our research team is diligently working to learn more about how those plans turned into a reality. Uh, were the plans, did they match actually the services that were delivered? Uh, did the students actually receive the services that were offered? We're conducting interviews with key ASAP staff and we, and we administered a one-year survey to both program and control students so we can then compare the types of services that both groups received and see what the differences look like. This might give us some insight as to whether or not certain of the program features made the bigger difference. Second, we still need to see if these promising but very early findings translate into effects on graduation. ASAP's main goal is to, is to improve three-year graduation rates, and most of the components of the program last for three years, unlike many of the other interventions that we've discussed that only last for a semester or two. So in order for this program to be considered a success, they really want to know that it had an impact on graduation rates. Third, and this is very important, as, as Tom mentioned, is we need to know more about what ASAP costs, and that's probably what a lot of people are wondering. This new world that ASAP is trying to create is certainly more expensive than CUNY's usual services, but how much more expensive? And is the program cost effective? That's something we hope to look to in the future. MDRC recently released our first report on this project, and we'd love for you to visit our website and check it out. I think that it's on your flash drive as well, and there were copies outside, although when I looked before, it looks like they've all been taken up. So um, you can read that for more detail. And in addition, there's a breakout session that has, like I said, the project's director, Sue Scribner, who's sitting in the back, as well as Donna Linderman, who's ASAP's director, and they will be available to answer any tough questions that you have about the program and the effects. If you have easy questions, you can ask them afterwards. Uh, 
thanks a lot. And uh, that's it. Thank you, Mike. I'm afraid my slides are. Thank you. 
data came from NPR's site visits, from periodic telephone interviews with the site visits, and from the, the uh, participating colleges and reports. So this pie chart shows you what the strategies were, and it makes clear that the majority of them fell into two big categories. The first is those are shown in light gray, and they included paired or linked courses for learning communities, modularized courses, contextualized instruction, things that happen in the classroom. The second major category, shown in medium gray, includes student support strategies, and under this rubric, we counted both personal and academic supports. So the category included case management and counseling, but also two. with students and sometimes with students. Yeah. 
that's what makes the fiat gentle. But they're not allowed to deviate from the specified approach, and that's what makes it fiat. What makes this efficient as a scaling mechanism is that resources in the form of instructors are readily available. You just need to change how they are deployed. But note the caveat. While this may be an efficient way of scaling up, what really matters is whether the intervention is effective, whether it makes a difference with our students. And this remains an open question, especially when this method of scaling by gentle fiat um, arouses active resentment and pushback. And this happened in both the cases that were reported. In one instance, the resistance was mild. In the second, more serious. In both cases, the instructors became more accepting, but only over time. Some of the forces that impede scaling up are the reverse of the ones that promote it. Inadequate resources, insufficient communication. Some seem ingrained in how many community colleges do business, giving students a choice about how they want to learn, giving teachers a choice about what they want to teach. Some are rooted in the scheduling constraints that face community college students who are often juggling work and family responsibilities. We also noted some deliberate cases of scaling back, as when resources were spread so thin that administrators decided that this approach was just not working. And some colleges didn't want to scale up further without at least some evidence that their strategies were making a difference. A couple of college presidents I interviewed talked about the need for evaluation while scaling up, since they noted strategies that work at a small scale don't necessarily work at a look as well at a larger level. Now, the evaluation was not charged with conducting a rigorous study of the impacts of the focus strategies, and what I'm uh, going to share with you cannot be taken as evidence of a causal of a causal relationship between participation in these strategies and outcomes. That said, when we compare the strategies for those who participated in the focus strategies with outcomes for students who were targeted by the strategies but didn't participate, and we control for those uh, student characteristics for which we had data available, we found that participation in the focus strategies was much more likely to make a positive difference than a negative one, although it was most likely not to make a difference in either direction, positive or negative. Interestingly, though, there didn't seem to be a relationship between the degree to which a strategy was scaled up and whether it was associated with positive, negative, or neutral um, outcome differences. We argue that the DEI was more than the sum of its focal strategies. Colleges put in place other policies and interventions that we didn't measure. Um, the initiative gave colleges resources for professional development and technical assistance, and some of the TA providers are seated in this room here. Um, and, then, and the initiative also sparked discussions about placement tests, about what the developmental sequence should look like. Um, and in general, about how to structure the experience of experiences of developmental students to lead to greater success. So in conclusion, I would call the DEI a win, but not a big win. This may not be surprising given the fact that it didn't call for a radical transformation of uh, the, the experience of developmental students or of the colleges in, um, that they attended. And it wasn't very specific about the level of scale up that was sought. Finally, the underlying theory that more is better makes sense only if less is good. That is, if what you're doing at a smaller scale is effective in the first place. The DEI teaches us that scaling up is difficult and slow, that we should be optimistic but also cautious, and that we should resist making great claims for what can be achieved in the short term. 
then I would like to invite you all to the breakout session that Kathleen Cleary of Sinclair Community College um, is leading. Uh, Sinclair was uh, a DEI college, and she'll talk about that college's experience with Scale Up, and we'll invite you to share your own thoughts and experiences with Scaling Up as well. Finally, at the end of the PowerPoint, um, and I believe this is all on your flash drives. I've listed some resources for finding out more about the DEI. I'd especially like to put in a good word for MDC's publication, From More to Most, which I think is a really useful how-to guide about scaling up interventions. Thank you. It's kind of like that. Um, she just gave me a quick elbow and we laughed about it. We, we laugh about it frequently. Um, I'm, uh, again, from the Community College Research Center and I study primarily teaching and learning in the developmental education space. And today I'm here to talk about some exciting research we were able to conduct this spring in partnership with the Virginia Community College System um, and with the support of NCPR. Uh, so I'll begin by thanking um, our team, Sue Zawadi Tao, Melissa, Rachel, Michelle, Sung Woo. Um, it took a lot of us to get out this spring and, and look into what was happening in Virginia, as well as our partners at the VCCS, many of whom are here with us today. So for those of you who do not know, um, and I assume most do, Virginia's community colleges decided to take a closer look at student outcomes in developmental education back in 2008, convening a multi-stakeholder task force that looked at current offerings and how those current offerings were or were not meeting the needs of underprepared students. And they reframed those poor outcomes as the starting point for a statewide redesign of their developmental math, English, and reading. Um, it was a long process, lots of people and, and task force and other things involved, but um, Virginia has done a wonderful job cataloging those activities, so I encourage you to read the turning point, the critical point, the focal point, all reports that uh, chronicle what happened during this process, uh, in part because we don't have time today to dig into them, um, but certainly wonderful resources. Additionally, the uh, ATD and DEI reports on Virginia published by Jobs for the Future are wonderful, um, provide very helpful information in, in terms of the policy context. Sure, here we go. So in this partnership with the VCCS, our team got off you know, relatively light compared to the, the work their team actually did. We visited eight colleges. Um, and as Susan will talk about uh, shortly, um, and Jane Serbiak will discuss in the breakout uh, 4E, the VCCS constructed a formative assessment and support team uh, that visited all 23 colleges um, in about three months with conference season thrown in there um, to get a look at early implementation of the math redesign. Now we're obviously at a very nascent stage in the redesign where we're not yet able to talk much about student outcomes. So this presentation previews highlights from a forthcoming paper on first semester implementation. Uh, based on research questions, we developed around what the enactment of the design look, redesign looked like on the ground at these colleges and how various stakeholders perceived and experienced early implementation of the math redesign. Um, notably, we're discussing math um, since the English redesign does not launch until spring 2013. Okay, so I'm gonna try to give a very, very basic description of the math redesign, but I certainly encourage you to dig into the many resources that are out there that give you much more information. Um, in, in particular, for those who are interested in the actual content, I'd recommend you take a look at the Curriculum Guide for Developmental Math um, that's on the VCCS website, or ask Jane at the breakout, since she was also involved in that process. So first, the new developmental math curriculum is designed to reflect the prerequisite needs uh, for college math. So not to repeat whole high school, middle school, or elementary school math courses. 
Second, those prerequisite learning objectives are organized into nine one unit, uh, one credit units. Each of those units has specified learning objectives, which were developed by math faculty in the state. Uh, third, to determine which of those units a student is required to take, um, a diagnostic assessment test was developed. The fourth, the required units um, depend on placement based on this assessment test, but also they depend on the student's program of study. For example, students who are pursuing an associate's degree in liberal arts are required to take unit, units one through five. Students who may be looking at degrees in math and science are required to take units not one through nine or show proficiency in units one through nine. So that could be done through the assessment test or through actual completion of the modules. So this compares to a previous regime, which wasn't universally consistent across the state, but um, on average was a three course sequence where those courses counted for anywhere between, cumulative, cumulatively, anywhere between nine to upwards of 15 credits. And finally, and maybe sort of most important for, for me, is that colleges are required to adhere to the redesigned framework, that is the modularized curriculum, the implementation of the diagnostic assessment, but they also have quite a bit of discretion over how to deliver these units. So what did we see? Um, implementation in the math redesign varies widely across a number of dimensions. There was um, some, but not as wide a variation as I expected to see on the use of technology. And I just want to talk about a little bit about that first. Um, all but three of the colleges uh, exclusively delivered the units through computer-mediated classrooms. In other words, students were in computer labs, um, working through, using instructional software, uh, and that software introduced content, allowed them to practice concepts, and was used to assess their learning. Um, so this was a relatively consistent uh, a feature, though there was some variation. But what we were really struck by was the variation on dimensions like staffing, where some classes were taught by a single instructor, some were team taught, some had embedded tutors, on areas like grouping, how students were grouped within the classes. Um, so that could be by unit or a mixed group. Um, and even around the amount of instructional time, and I'll talk a little bit about that uh, more shortly. While the redesign by design was intended to reshape the role of the instructor, we saw that play out differently as well, in part based on the implementation decisions that colleges made. Um, it, what was also unique about that is while that redefinition occurred of the college uh, in the math instructor role, we also saw variations across the colleges in terms of what resources or supports were available to help faculty with that transition. So I think somebody, we've heard things like flipping DevEd on its head, radical redesigns. This was requiring a, a big change of faculty and we saw that playing out differently uh, across the colleges. All right. The other point that stuck out to us was the um, variations, there was variation in uh, uh, instructional time, definitions of proficiency, and in that respect we were talking about how much content or what assessments students um, were required to take. So those tended to vary across the colleges and made us think from an evaluation standpoint how are we going to interpret those things to understand how this is effective and what elements of this redesign are effective in what ways? All right. So this slide gives you a bit of a visual on what we were talking about in terms of this variation. What we saw, the use of instructional technology, you could kind of perceive that 
this, if you looked at this as a continuum, the majority of colleges were kind of towards the left side of this continuum line using primarily computer mediated instructional delivery. That wasn't the case for all. There were some colleges um, that still had what one would view as a traditional instructor led model. Um, student grouping was unique in that we saw situations where colleges um, tried to group students who were in the same units together. Um, it was a, but for sometimes for pra practical but not necessarily preferable reasons, they couldn't always do that. So imagine you have a certain number of students who are in unit three, uh, taking a class at a particular day on a particular time, um, but you don't have enough of them to warrant a full class. So sometimes you had to group them with ones or twos or maybe one through nine, uh, students who are on units one through nine. So you saw this mix. One thing that was interesting about this heterogeneous grouping was that you saw instructors may have to answer a question about a whole number with one student, and then the next student may be asking about graphing a quadratic equation. So what it emphasized was faculty certainly needed to have a full range of content knowledge, but they also had to be nimble. They, it wasn't as if I'm operating in a discrete pre-algebra course and I know kind of my content will range from X to, to Y. Faculty had to be very uh, nimble in their ability to work with students. We were surprised again to see some of the variation in instructional time. We weren't quite sure how this would play out, in particular because colleges had so much discretion in terms of uh, how to deliver the units. So we saw instructional models with as few as 100 uh, minutes per week and some as is, is far as uh, 240 minutes per week. A big range. Unfortunately, you know, at this stage we don't really know what the impact of that may mean for student learning. Reflecting on some of our work out of the Hewlett uh, Foundation grant that we have called Scaling Innovation, we've certainly seen that more instructional time doesn't always result in better outcomes. So it's in, in essence a natural experiment for us. It's gonna give us an opportunity to understand a little bit better what does instructional time mean? How much instructional time for what students is most impactful? To close, I just want to highlight a few features of Virginia's comprehensive dev ed redesign process that I think can inform other states as well as uh, even college-wide initiatives. Um, first, they purposefully designed a strategic planning process that engaged faculty and administrators and other stakeholders. And our data suggests that even those who have yet to buy in to the redesigns can articulate why the state has gone down this road. So the fundamental rationale for the reform was articulated clearly and widely, which I think is a really important step. To the debate remains, that debate is around that how, that how that's happening at the college level primarily. So while much of that how will have to be resolved at the colleges, the emergence of college and state level formative assessment um, efforts is facilitating that process. And Susan and Jane can talk about that a bit more. We've seen some campuses where faculty are already reviewing early data, honing the curriculum, um, adjusting some of these dimensions we talked about uh, to, uh, uh, for the fall. So there's already some evolution, some assessment, some refinement already in the works. But critical to this work during the first semester has been the Developmental Math Implementation Support Team, also known as DMIST. And this is a group of people that uh, provided, um, visited the colleges and provided feedback and support to the colleges in this process. And importantly, it gave the state office a lens into what was actually happening. So student, Susan is going to talk a bit more about that. And I encourage you to come to Breakout 4E, where you can get information both on the actual redesign, but also on the process that they've used this spring to, to dig into what's happening at the campuses and think about what supports or resources the system level can offer. Susan? Oh, you know how to do Okay. Thank you, Nikki. We're glad to have you as a Virginian anytime. <laughs> 
<laughs> You're welcome at all of our colleges and in the system office. In fact, you were there this week, earlier this week. So, um, so we thank you for all that you do there. Um, I'm Susan Wood. My title is Vice Chancellor for Academic Services and Research for Virginia's Community Colleges. I work in our system office. Um, just a little bit of uh, background, we have 23 colleges on 40 campuses that span Virginia. We have just under 300,000 students in credit courses and serve an additional 100 plus thousand in um, non-credit and other workforce services. Um, we are a uh, centralized system with a single state uh, governing board appointed by the governor and colleges have lay uh, advisory boards, local advisory boards then that they uh, can develop college policy but never in conflict with the VCCS policy. What this governance framework does and in particular our work with our academic and student services officers is, is that it has given us over the years that Nikki described and even before an opportunity to truly launch a student success initiative that is multi-pronged and that has included as a significant component the developmental education um, redesign. When Janet was speaking earlier, she mentioned the state policy arm of the DEI initiative. We were uh, selected for that after being around one state for achieving the dream. As we entered Achieving the Dream uh, with five colleges and then later a sixth college joining in round four, it was always to have our 23 colleges involved. And that's been pivotal in how we have reaped the benefits of um, our involvement, not only in ATD, but also in the Developmental Education Initiative. And there's been immense value gained from working with um, with, within the DEI initiative with our uh, state, uh, other state policy teams and with the uh, partners uh, who have uh, led that initiative, the, the uh, JFF, MDRC, uh, working with CCRC, there's just been innumerable benefits that have really helped us come to the point where Nikki could say the things that she just said and where I can talk about uh, the things that, that I will right now. Um, Nikki asked me in particular to uh, take the uh, perspective of uh, the state, state, state piece and state policy piece having to do with the DMIST work and that's what she spoke to as her last bullet there on her slide, the Developmental Mathematics Implementations support team, which was an opportunity that we had this spring to um, look uh, rather deeply and on the ground look at how colleges are operating within the midst of, of uh, what I would call a, a massive sweeping reform in Virginia of our developmental education work. So the idea of conducting this all-college visit, I don't have slides, by the way. <laughs> um, the idea of conducting this all-college visit initiative um, during the first semester of new course rollout, keep in mind that our new courses in, the, in developmental math began in uh, January 12, just um, six months ago. And this was a flip the switch implementation. Colleges did not have an option. Um, this was a system-wide change. We disabled the previous courses, the uh, high stakes courses that Nikki mentioned that were had upwards of, um, uh, most of them were around the 14 credit level. Uh, and so um, this was uh, an abrupt change and I'll, I'll speak to that a little bit. But the idea of conducting this, um, this all college visit initiative was hatched by a former system colleague of ours named Donna Yovanovitch, whom some of you know. Um, Donna now it works in institutional effectiveness at one of our institutions. When she first mentioned this idea to me, I think I laughed out loud, um, and not just quietly. Um, <laughs> I mean, it was, I, I said, are you kidding? Um, <laughs> so the notion gradually took root as we planned for this initial semester of rollout. Um, our chancellor, Glenn Dubois, had uh, set a precedent in doing uh, not just once, but actually two or three times. He has done town hall meetings across the state at all 23 institutions for specific purposes. And he also conducted over the past academic year 23 visits to our colleges to find out about how they are doing with a system level engineering initiative that has nearly 30 initiatives in, uh, underneath it, underneath the overall umbrella of re-engineering, of which uh, the developmental education redesign is truly a hallmark project. In fact, it predated the uh, formal re-engineering launching um, and was folded into it as re-engineering um, 
began to t uh, get some traction here. And it was our chancellor's support for this project, including the fiscal support. You can imagine sending a team of at least four to each of 23 colleges um, for uh, some of those out in the Southwest um, where uh, most of the team hailed from either Northern Virginia or Richmond area and um, having them um, do that circuit. Um, so it was his support that truly made this possible and our state board as well as uh, our chancellor and our presidents have had interest in seeing this student success obstacle of developmental education um, truly be a, something that propels students to success instead of uh, limits their success. Um, our redesign lives in a set of tensions within our system and I thought it might be helpful to just articulate some of those tensions and then talk about why the DMIST initiative was truly the next right step for us. Um, so the first tension is the tension between one system and 23 colleges and there's even a third dimension of that and that's the 23 colleges plus the system office. So sometimes we are one, sometimes 23 and sometimes 24. Um, that one system with the centralized governing board, as I mentioned, gave us a tremendous platform for launching our developmental education redesign in the context of the larger um, work on student success. One of our five strategic plan goals is an aggressive uh, student success goal that guides all the colleges in a common direction and the case for change was built strongly within our academic and student services officers through that culture of evidence that surfaced um, from ATD that uh, really showed that the need was great for developmental education uh, reform and redesign in order to um, move that needle with regard to those students who come in not college ready. We are also 23 unique colleges, rural, urban, suburban, each with its own culture, student population, college policies, and practices that are rooted in history. Um, this what, does that sound familiar to any of you? <laughs> uh, this was the platform for college implementation of the redesign. So as you heard from Nikki, we had the system level infrastructure. We noted that our, our issues had to do with a system wide infrastructure of uh, high stakes courses, content that was um, uh, not streamlined and backward looking and in some cases instead of looking into um, the college curricula and courses and a placement instrument that was not customized to our content. So those were big pieces that we were grappling at the system level. That college implementation, uh, it was in, in light of all of the uniqueness and diversity, beautiful diversity of our 23 colleges. And there is sometimes an us and them. Um, colleges, college staff will, or leaders will sometimes say, um, the system office is making us do this. Or, um, and that may be true and it may not. Uh, so there is a distinction there, but um, th there is that us and them mentality that sometimes gets in the way of, of what we are trying to do. The second tension is a tension between redesign and developmental mathematics as a large scale implementation that touched all parts of the institution versus student success that happens one student at a time in the context of a classroom and a college environment. So when we count those student success numbers, that student success truly happens one student at a time. Another credential that I bring to my work every day is being a longtime math faculty member at one of our colleges and uh, teaching many for many years um, developmental mathematics as well as the college level courses where I knew the students were heading. And so um, that one student at a time is, is truly what happens, but we look at it large scale with this implementation. Our implement implementation touched the obvious academic student services as expected, but also administration, financial aid, admissions and records, uh, testing centers, instructional technology, academic support, distance learning, professional development, even IT as it supports our student information system changes that resulted from the redesign. This was a whole college change. But again, a student reaching a success measure of graduation or transfer are those intermediate milestones that help us un unpack student success is hugely personal and often happens in an insulated setting in the institution, growing out of a relationship with individuals that has fostered and nurtured that student to success. The next tension is a tension between what is and what could be. 
What is, is the comfort and security of what is known, the current operating procedures, or for a faculty member, the current content, the current way I teach, the current structure of classes in our master course file. There's comfort and knowing and a security in that. The what could be, and indeed for many of our faculty, the what was to come, and what has come indeed, had no small level of discomfort, uncertainty, loss of control, and insecurity. Yes, we had faculty involved in many ways, hundreds of faculty involved, but unless you, you as a particular faculty member, were sitting at that table, the level of ownership and, uh, was different. And it, 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 it felt strange for many of our longtime faculty in particular. The fourth tension is the tension between launching a major initiative designed by the representative group, I just spoke to this, and an implementation that instead infects, affects hundreds of faculty and staff and thousands of students. So that's a little taste of our environment and the environment in which the DMIST project was launched. Nikki mentioned the research questions. We're grateful to CCRC for assisting us with research design and protocols for the system project. Uh, Jane Servisek, as was mentioned, is doing the breakout session next, and she'll be able to unpack more some of those preliminary results on the DMIS team. And I'd like to acknowledge my colleagues uh, from the system office, and we also have a representative from one of our colleges who've been instrumental in helping move that redesign forward. Um, our purpose in the DMIST was for uh, waving the flag of support for colleges. The sweeping design was clearly invasive and involved change at, change at an unparalleled level in our system. We needed to take a firm early stance expressing continued support for colleges, not to have them feel that they were being turned loose with the redesign and now ignored once the switch had been flipped, but rather that we were there alongside them listening to their concerns and developing action plans. Feedback was important to us and to the colleges. Jane has authored um, nearly 23 right, uh, college reports along with the team that visited. And you'll hear more about that team from Jane if you visit that session. Um, feedback to colleges, commending them for their, the successes of their implementation and pointing to advancements that they could consider. Jane has collected tools used by some colleges that can provide a great um, uh, platform for sharing those innovations with other colleges. Indeed, the early feedback for us at the system level is um, available in a, in a level not previously in our current model. We knew that colleges were using uh, placement processes differently in our previous uh, iteration of developmental math. We knew that course content differed, even though we had a common paragraph course description. We knew all that was happening, but we didn't have the, but both the bird's eye and the ground level view that the DMIST has provided. So we're very grateful for this opportunity. It's given us a comprehensive look, just as the redesign permeated all aspects of the institution, so did the research protocol in visiting classrooms, talking to students, faculty, leaders, IT folks, uh, making the changes in our um, student information system, and more. We are now using the results to develop short and long-term action plans, and uh, we're eager to address those needs and determine which of those are system-level issues and which are college. And we're also preparing for our English implementation. We knew that the DMIST results would have bearing on our implementation of English that's coming up. Our model for English is very, very different, but there are still some parallels, we believe, that we can extract from college structures to support implementation. With that, I'll close, and uh, I thank you very much. Okay, thank you to all of our panelists, uh, including our two Virginia representatives. Uh, we have about 15 minutes for questions uh, or comments, so please uh, make use of the two microphones here, and if you could just uh, introduce your, yourself and where you're from. Good morning, I'm Emily Lardner. I co-direct the Washington Center with Gillies Malnark, and I'm um, a teacher, and I'm very interested, Tom, you talked about the shared vision for developmental education, and I'm interested in the panelists' 
sense of the vision of mm -hmm. teachers as professionals. Um, um, because in practice, it ranges from the really super work of teachers like Jane and Katie and Peter, whose initiatives were building on to um, another, the kind of the, the most reductive version of teachers where mm -hmm. teachers are put into labs and handed um, notes so that they know how to talk to students. So we really don't need much teacher judgment. So what's your sense of the role of teachers in this? <laughs> okay. Um, uh, my perspective on DevEd is it, you know, it can't be made teacher proof. Um, so I think the role of teachers is critical. And, um, you know, the one thing we've seen in our work in classrooms across our Virginia work and others is that, you know, faculty engage reform efforts or their practice in lots of different ways, bring lots of different things to the to the process and if you want to work with them on whether it's doing something different or enhancing their current efforts, um, we don't really have a lot of systems in place to support that. I mean, faculty, professional learning at the higher ed space isn't something that we've spent a whole heck of a lot, a lot of time uh, focusing on. Um, you know, that said, I, you know, I'm, I'm optimistic. I think the work in this spring looking at faculty who have been really kind of turned upside down for a lot of them in their roles, they acknowledge, they said things like, I don't feel like I'm teaching anymore, or, um, it th you know, opinions along those lines. And I think, you know, that was heard, and I think they're thinking about what they can do um, to continue to support student learning um, in, in their classrooms. And then, just importantly, I don't think it never ends. So I think part of the issue is that colleges or consortia or networks of faculty have to continuously provide space and resources for faculty to continue to evolve. And, and, and I think that's a natural part of the work that they do. So um, I think there are very real and legitimate questions about what task technology are best used for. Um, and I think we need empirically to understand that a little bit better, but um, I still think the notion and the actual work in the, in the presence, the, this notion of instructor presence is a really, really impactful thing on students' experiences. And I, I would, you know, I don't think that's something we can take away. I think that's something we have to develop. As we were engaging in uh, the major redesign of the various components, uh, placement, curriculum, content, so on, uh, we knew that uh, pedagogy was a part of that and could not be left untouched or our redesign would not reach its full potential. And so we've looked at a, a number of, of um, of things to support that. They're professional development oriented, uh, but what we've considered is a comprehensive plan. In fact, we have this in development uh, now. A comprehensive plan for faculty who teach developmental education courses, a comprehensive professional development plan. What are the pieces and parts of that? So we've been looking at that. We have engaged for the second year now in a Chancellor's Developmental Education Institute that brings 50 uh, developmental educators together in a retreat like setting for a week. Our uh, facilitators last summer and uh, this past summer uh, included Dr. Boylan and his staff from the National Center for Developmental Education. Jane, in fact, was a participant in that this past summer. But the purpose of that is to build a cadre of developmental um, educators, professional, um, who, who, are, who can then serve as leaders and catalysts for change back on their campuses. Other pieces and parts of that have, include tech, have included technology delivery of professional development opportunities. And, and so we've been delivering webinars. For example, our English model is an integrated reading and writing, and that makes some of the English faculty uh, a bit uncomfortable. And that's an understatement. <laughs> and so we've had some um, webinars with some uh, leaders. Um, in fact, we had um, Katie Hearn do one for us at a symposium with about 150 um, developmental educators. So we're really trying to tackle that from a system level. It's a great question and not an easy answer. And I think it is an answer that um, is still evolving and will continue to evolve as delivery methods um, change in the midst of our work in developmental. 
I would just add to that, I think uh, many of the most promising reforms we've seen where things have actually scaled up have really involved campus-based faculty development, um, where it's not something faculty are sent to and taught once a year, but becomes part of the campus environment. Uh, admittedly, there are only a handful of examples, but we've heard about Kingsborough Community College and the campus-based uh, professional development they have for learning communities, which I think has led to extraordinary changes throughout that campus. Uh, also, through some of our Achieving the Dream work, actually preceding some of the uh, initiative that you've talked about uh, on this panel. Uh, but uh, one of the Virginia colleges, I believe it was Patrick Henry, had a, a center for collaborative learning, I believe it was called, uh, that involved all faculty. Uh, a particular challenge when so many faculty are part-time and adjunct and ways to bring them into the fold and make them part of this process. Mike. Hi, Tom. Thank you. Mike Collins, Jobs for the Future. Um, I, I um, would like uh, to get the panel's reaction to the pace of research and reform, and I'm asking that question in the context of Virginia's statewide redesign. I mean, right, you're serving students uh, now, in the classroom now, you want to be guided by research, but you actually had to, um, you know, have a big solution to a big problem. Uh, you, you did a process, you began rolling it out, and then, uh, you know, there's conversation about, you know, uh, well, what is the evidence, and, you know, why this and not that, and so, I guess my question is really around how do we sequence what we know with the, the need for action now? Susan, so you acted boldly and then there is talk around you know, whether or not you should have done the approach you've done. So could you just give a, a sense of uh, your thinking about that? I would say in our, thank you Mike for that question, I would say in our system we had no choice but to act boldly. Uh, the, uh, the, the, the forces were, had convened in such a way or uh, converged in such a way that we had a uh, graduation and retention data not going anywhere, it was flat. Um, and that was through the six years of a previous strategic plan. That was not acceptable in an environment where we were beginning to talk about completion, not in the way we're talking about it now, but those discussions were beginning. We have a visionary chancellor who is action-oriented. Um, we knew that uh, we needed to do something. We could build that case for change. We had some of the tools and supports to do that through the very work that we've talked about here this morning. And so we were equipped to do that. Um, clearly, as we have heard from across the nation, there are different varieties and, and ways to think about this, um, this developmental education redesign. Ours is not perfect. Ours fit us and came out of that, that system level work. We are eager for research about what we did and about what others are doing that can help inform us. So yes, we took a bold step. Others have used other adjectives to describe that. <laughs> we took a very bold step. And it was, uh, I remember a, a, a difficult meeting with, um, one of the difficult meetings with some faculty where the question was, how do you know this is going to work? And that goes back a little bit to the comfort and security of the known versus the risk and uh, insecurity of the unknown. And the only answer I could give is that what we are doing now is not acceptable. And so we are going in this direction with the idea that we'll follow a continuous improvement model. And we expect to incorporate the results of research, hopefully about us, and, and that others have used. I, I, for example, our customized uh, placement instrument is a single measure that we are using. And we're talking about alternative measures so that, for example, SAT and ACT would waive a certain benchmark there or, well, actually, that's in policy now, uh, will waive the um, uh, need to take the placement instrument. But the discussions here around multiple measures, I think we will certainly take back and have discussions with our academic officers and student services officers about how do we begin to think about that. So, um, so I think, Mike, this is a, I think I'm talking around your question and not necessarily addressing it, but we are eager to see research, whatever is available and, and uh, on us and, and on others so that we can take those um, promising practices and incorporate them and further tweak what we've done. Should, the delay, should we delay our action in um, waiting for research? Well, we didn't. <laughs> so, uh, I don't know if anybody else wants yeah, to respond I'll, to that. I'll say a little about that. It's not quite as relevant because it's much smaller scale, but, but ASAP certainly, I think, in its design was in part based on some of the research that has come out over the last 10 years or so. So, 
they actually took some of the information that came from the financial aid research that's happened both at MDRC and Eric Bettinger and Bridget Terry Long. They, they've looked at financial reforms and seen what kind of effect that has, and that's part of the reason why part of the intervention has to do with providing financial supports. And MDRC has done some research about the effect of enhanced advising, and so they included enhanced advising in the intervention. And we've also studied the effectiveness of success courses, so that was part of the intervention. So they've tried to use some of that information in designing it. Now, they also had a lot of foundation funding to make it doable, um, but they've actually tried to incorporate some of the research into the program, not in the exact form of the program that we studied, but they adapted in ways that seems to have been pretty effective so far. And I would just add, Mike, that while most of the DEI strategies were not heavily research-based, um, that the strategies related to instructional relevance, that is contextualization um, and collaborative learning, do have um, strong and rigorous uh, evidence that, that of effectiveness. If I can just, one other point I think kind of the reality check of this, and I don't mean to undermine my own field, is um, people, practitioners have to work with imperfect information all the time. They don't have the luxury of necessarily waiting for something to be found out to be effective. And even if it is found out to be effective, there's no guarantee that they will implement it in a way that will allow that to happen in their context. So I think part of us you know, we need to continue to, to certainly try our best to identify what practices are most effective and what seems to be working for what students, but also understand the processes that kind of mix with that reality on the ground. And I mean, Mike, I, you, I know you obviously know this from the policy context, but I think that uh, you, I would never tell a college don't do something because I don't know for sure that that's going to work. I'd love for them to be thoughtful and purposeful um, and, and spend a lot of time on the how that I talked about um, because frankly it may be more important than the what. Yes, Terry. Can everyone hear Terry's question? Uh, so she was asking uh, the panel um, as they were working through this, these various reforms they get a lot of pushback from administrators and, and others uh, about loss of FTE in particular. If I could speak to that, that's a, that's a great question. In fact, we've been looking at those data just this very week with our presidents um, and um, thinking about what that impact is. We had a president observe that the FTE and developmental math went down, and of course you know what that means to the um, college purse there. Um, so, and uh, our chancellor's response was, yeah, that's not a bad thing <laughs> that the FT and, and developmental math went down because again we're talking about those 14 credits worth of three levels of developmental math that if, if the student didn't pass the first time had to re-enroll in the four or five credit class to retake. And so so we we had an expectation of an FTE loss. Our headcount dipped a little bit, but not uh, not as much as the FTE, which is what we expected. And um, so what I think happened in our state, and I'd, I'd, um, I'd be interested, I guess, uh, afterwards in the perspectives of my colleagues here from Virginia, but um, what I think happened in our state is that the commitment to student success outweighed um, by the tone set by our chancellor, and, and he supervises all the presidents, so followed by the presidents, um, to truly make a strong statement about our work in developmental education and how we needed to do better there. And that outweighed the limiting factor of, but what's that going to mean to the income that I get from FTE? So it was a reality with which we've lived. We can now quantify that at least for the first semester and talk about our, FTE, our reduction in FTE for that first semester. But there's some other, at least for the summer as well, we've got some other things going on, as I'm sure you all do too, at, who are from institutions with Summer Pell and so on. So we have, we, we're also at a point um, in Virginia where we had uh, 50,000 new students over a, um, a two-year period 
and then uh, now our enrollment is leveling off and in fact summer is looking down a little bit so we have that phenomenon going on too so how much of the FTE reduction is due to redesign well we can look at those data but the causality again we don't know for sure okay Peter you get our last question okay well I'd like to take another run at Michael Collins question um, and and that's this I first of all I think all of us are pretty much in, in agreement that we need to do something so that developmental education has much better outcomes than it has so far. And I think there's widespread spread recognition that the idea of starting it at one college and, and that it will somehow magically sprout up all over the country is, is, has not seemed to have had a scaling up result. And then it seems to me that we, we then are leaping to the other extreme, which is then let's do it statewide as you all have done in Virginia in a very impressive way. I, I think it's quite an accomplishment. But, and, and sometimes people say, well, that's the two choices, start little or start big. But there is an intermediate choice. And so my question is, did you consider, instead of 23 colleges scaling up in spring of 2012, something in the middle like trying it out with a smaller number of colleges gathering some data, tweaking the system, and, and making it better so for, for the big rollout, and also beginning to get some research, some data, so that it would be convincing to those people who had has reservations about whether this was a good innovation or not. I, I'd just like to add that I've heard lots of people say, developmental education is broken, it's not working, we can't make it any worse. And I would like to argue that we can. I don't, I don't want to su suggest you are in Virginia, mm -hmm. but I'm quite worried about Connecticut. Yeah. And so I think we can make it worse. And, and I, think, I think we have a window here of the next few years when there's foundation support and government support and CCRC support that we have a window, and MDRC <laughs> support, we have a window to, to try to really get it right, and it's port important that we do. So I wondered if that was a thing you considered, that sort of middle model of starting with a, a, a half a dozen schools and producing some data and, and then tweaking the system to make sure it's going to work before you rolled it out. Thank you, Peter. That's a, that's a great question. We, we did have some examples within our colleges of institutional innovations that were similar to our redesign, um, but were not done in quite that order. So the order you describe is you, you have the vision and direction and you launch it at, at a few colleges and then you determine the results and then go to scale. Our uh, institutional innovations were not launched in the context of what was to be uh, the forthcoming um, system innovation. But for example, one of the DEI institutions had um, used the uh, uh, BSK modules, they were called for um, taking the math curriculum and dividing it up. So we had some, some data and some information from there. Another college had also done that on one of its campuses. Uh, Jane's College, Northern Virginia C uh, Community College, which is our largest college, was already moving in this direction as the system-wide redesign was happening. They had an affiliation with NCAT, and so they were, they were moving to a, um, a, I would call it, modified emporium um, methodology and launched a semester earlier but not the full implementation. So it was a little bit of a, of a um, hybrid Im implementation. But we're able to then, through their work, to give us some early results on that. Peter, one of the reasons we didn't is because of our SIS issues, um, our financial aid, also with um, the um, Colleges, uh, our colleges are so different that a success at one college, as you have just pointed out, a success at one college does not promise a smooth adaptation at another. And so if we did this at eight colleges, um, we would then still have 15 to navigate that. And so our thinking early on was that this truly would be a system-wide holistic change in the structure for developmental mathematics. We did not want to have um, two placement instruments going on at once. We did not, and our placement now tracks right into, it's a placement diagnostic combo, tracks right into those one credit courses. So it, it would have been very difficult for us to have parallel deliveries, either within a college or across colleges, given our centralized um, constraints. So that was part of the thinking. Not to let that drive it, however, because that should never drive anything, right? 
<laughs> and uh, I, I just mentioned uh, briefly, our, one of our breakout sessions is on the Gates Foundation's Completion by Design Initiative, which intentionally is starting with clusters of colleges in four states, uh, partly to try out this middle ground approach, Peter, that, that you were suggesting. Um, I want to thank the panelists for a great discussion, and thank you for your questions. During the breakout sessions, you can hear more about each of these initiatives that the panelists represented, as well as Completion by Design and the new CUNY Community College. So we look forward to seeing you there. Oh, thank you. Oh, thank you so much. I saw your hand.